The following is an encore presentation of Everything Everywhere Daily. In February 1904, the Russian Empire found itself at war with the Empire of Japan over what was territory in the current nation of China. The problem for Russia was that a big chunk of its navy was located in the Baltic Sea, and the war was in Asia. The Baltic fleet was sent on an incredibly long and interesting voyage to get the ships into battle. Learn more about the disastrous voyage of the Imperial Russian Baltic Fleet and how it helped change the course of Russian history on this episode of Everything Everywhere Daily. Okay, you can do this. I know, I know. Carvana makes it so convenient to sell your car. It's just hard to let go. My car and I have been through so much together. But look, you already have a great offer from Carvana. That was fast. Well, I know my license plate and VIN by heart, and those questions were easy. You're almost there. Now to just accept the offer and schedule a pickup or drop-off. How'd you do it? How are you so strong in letting go of your car? Well, I already made up my mind, and Carvana's so easy. Uh, yeah, true. And sold. Go to Carvana.com to sell your car the convenient way. This episode is sponsored by ButcherBox. As we gear up for the 4th of July, there's one thing on everybody's mind. Barbecues and cookouts. And what's the secret to an unforgettable cookout? High-quality meat, of course. And that's where ButcherBox comes in. ButcherBox delivers 100% grass-fed beef, free-range organic chicken, heritage breed pork, and wild-caught seafood right to your doorstep. No more last-minute runs to the store or settling for subpar cuts. With ButcherBox, you get the very best every time. Plus, all their products are humanely raised with no antibiotics or added hormones. It's quality you can taste and feel good about. Celebrate Independence Day by going to butcherbox.com daily and use code daily60 at checkout to enjoy your choice of bone-in chicken thighs, top sirloins, or salmon in every box for an entire year. Plus, use code DAILY60 to get an additional $20 off your first three orders. Again, that's ButcherBox.com daily and use code DAILY60. In 1904, Russia found itself at war with Japan. The proximate cause of the war was a Japanese attack on the primary Russian port in the Pacific at the time, Port Arthur. Today, Port Arthur is the Chinese city of Lushunko. The causes of the Russo-Japanese War were numerous and is not the focus of this episode, but suffice it to say that Japan was in ascendance and Russia was in decline, and this was the point where their interests clashed. When the war started, no one in Europe really thought much of it. An Asian nation had never beaten a European one since the days of the Mongol Empire. Everyone assumed, including the Russians, that the war would be a cakewalk. Unfortunately, the war took place in Asia, and most of Russia's military was in Europe. Most importantly for this episode, the largest part of their navy was located in the Baltic Sea outside of St. Petersburg. A bit about Russian geography. Despite being an enormous country, Russia has very little in the way of sea access. Getting a warm water port has been on the Russian wish list for centuries. They had St. Petersburg in the Baltic Sea, some ports on the Black Sea, which required passing through the Bosporus, an enormous coast on the Arctic Ocean, which is mostly useless for shipping, and a few ports in the North Pacific, which was far away from their population centers. So after several months of the war not going so well for Russia, the Tsar decided to move the Baltic fleet over to the Pacific to help relieve the besieged Port Arthur. This was actually pretty reasonable. You had ships over here, and they were needed over there. The problem was going from the Baltic to the North Pacific was about as far as you could sail on Earth. So on October 15, 1904, the fleet under the command of Admiral Zinovy Rostisvensky set out from St. Petersburg for Asia, a journey of 29,000 kilometers, assuming that they went through the Suez Canal. Here I should note that while Russia had a navy, it wasn't the best navy. Russia was traditionally a land power, a fact that will soon become obvious. On the first day of the voyage, the Russian flagship and a cargo ship ran aground. Not a very auspicious start. And while the ships were getting pulled out, a destroyer ran into a battleship. Admiral Rostosvensky was extremely vigilant. He assumed that the Japanese had sent ships to the Baltic to attack the Russians. There had been rumors of Japanese mining in the waters and of Japanese torpedo boats and submarines. 
All of the sailors were on high alert, which made everyone anxious. As they sailed around Denmark, a ship approached the fleet sailing right at them. So the Russian ships opened fire, totally missing the ship, which was actually a Russian cruiser called the Aurora. And it was delivering a message to the admiral saying that he had just been promoted. On October 25th, the fleet reached an area in the North Sea off the coast of England known as the Dogger Bank. In the middle of the night, in heavy fog, Russian spotters on duty saw what they assumed were Japanese torpedo boats. The Russians opened fire, and other ships in the fleet, hearing gunfire, returned fire. When everything calmed down, there were no Japanese warships. There were British fishing boats. The Russians sank one boat, damaged five others, and killed two people. They also happened to kill a sailor and a Russian Orthodox priest from their own fleet from friendly fire. So, even though they didn't have any guns, the British managed to fight them to a draw. The Dogger Bank incident almost led to war between the United Kingdom and Russia. The fleet continued south and briefly stopped off the coast of Tangiers in Morocco. The fleet had to split up because the battleships and large cruisers couldn't pass through the Suez Canal. While they briefly paused before the fleet split up, they dropped anchor and accidentally cut the telegraph line connecting Africa and Europe. The ships which had to sail around Africa didn't have any ports that they could stop at for refueling. Russia didn't have any ports, and neutral countries in the war legally couldn't help them, so they had to sail with an enormous amount of coal. They didn't have anywhere to put the coal, so there were just large piles of coal on the decks of the ships, which resulted in many crew members developing respiratory diseases en route to Asia. As the fleet rounded Africa, they decided to make a stop in Madagascar to give the crew a bit of rest and relaxation on January 2, 1905. The crew went ashore and purchased a bunch of exotic animals, including venomous snakes and crocodiles. These animals got loose on several ships, causing a host of problems. Then their refrigerated supply ship broke down, and they had to toss all of the now-spoiled meat overboard. They tried to do some target practice off the coast of Madagascar by having one of their ships tow a target. Not a single hit was registered on the target, but the ship that was towing it was damaged. One of the crew actually died en route and was given a funeral at sea. One of the ships fired a salute from its guns and hit another ship in the fleet. Conditions for the Russian sailors going around Africa were bad, as they never had experience that long at sea and never that warm of a climate. One ship almost mutinied. Finally, the two fleets were able to meet up and headed to China. They made a brief and somewhat illegal stop in Kamran Bay, Vietnam, which was under French control. There they found out that Port Arthur had already fallen, rendering their entire mission moot. However, by that point, they couldn't really turn back. The issue was fuel. In addition to just piling tons of coal on the decks of the ships, they were also refueled by several German ships en route. Now that they were as far as Vietnam, the only real option was to keep going and try to reach the Russian port of Vladivostok on the Pacific. However, to do so, without running out of coal, meant taking the most direct route through the Sea of Japan. Finally, after almost six months on the high seas, where the Baltic fleet was never really designed to operate, the ships approached the Tsushima Strait, the water separating Japan and Korea. There were 38 ships of the Baltic fleet, now called the 2nd and 3rd Pacific Squadrons, which had made it this far. As the fleet entered the Tsushima Strait on the evening of May 27th, there was a thick fog in the area. The fleet was running dark except for the hospital ship Orel, which had its lights on, as per the rules of war at the time. The Orel saw a ship approaching them in the distance, and assumed that they had finally encountered another Russian ship. They sent them a radio message giving the details about their number of ships and their locations. The ship they sent all this information to was not another Russian ship. It was the Japanese cruiser Shinanu Maru. After months of false warnings and sightings of Japanese ships, the first time they actually encountered a Japanese ship, not only did they not identify it, but they gave them their entire battle plan. The Shinanu Maru then radioed Admiral Togo, who sent a combined Japanese fleet of over 120 ships to intercept the Russian fleet. Given the performance of the Russian Navy up to this point, and given the overwhelming numbers of the Japanese fleet, you can probably guess the outcome. The Russians were annihilated. The Japanese lost three torpedo boats and 117 sailors in the battle. The raw tonnage of the Japanese ships lost was only 255 tons. The Russians had 21 ships that were sunk, which included 11 battleships, with an additional 14 ships captured. 5,045 Russian sailors were killed, 803 were injured, and 6,016 were captured. 
the total tonnage of the Russian ships lost was over 143,000 tons. Only three ships managed to slink into Vladivostok. The lopsidedness of this battle wasn't just a matter of superior Japanese numbers. They also had better weapons, better technology, and, quite frankly, better trained sailors. A single hit from a Japanese gun was usually enough to sink a Russian ship, whereas a hit from a Russian gun usually only damaged a Japanese ship. The ramifications of the Battle of Tsushima were wide-reaching. It effectually ended the Russo-Japanese War. Russia gave up its claims in the region and recognized Japanese control over Korea and the parts of Manchuria that it formerly controlled. As the first European power to lose to an Asian power, it greatly weakened Russia's influence in Europe as well as the standing of the Tsar. It so weakened his government that losing the war was in no small part responsible for his eventual downfall. The Battle of Tsushima became a central part of the 20th century Japanese imperial mythos, leading to the eventual domination of the region culminating in the Second World War 30 years later. Admiral Rossosvensky was wounded and captured. While he was in the hospital, he was visited by his counterpart, the Japanese Admiral Togo. He told him, quote, Defeat is a common fate of a soldier. There is nothing to be ashamed of in it. The great point is whether we have performed our duty, end quote. Rossosvensky was later put on trial and took full responsibility. He was sentenced to death, but it was later commuted by the Tsar to a short prison sentence. He died a few years later of a heart attack in St. Petersburg. The Battle of Tsushima was actually one of the most important battles of the 20th century. What made it significant wasn't the maneuvering or the tactics, because after all it was a lopsided route. What made it so important was the power shift that it represented. From this battle, you can draw a line to the eventual fall of Tsarist Russia, the rise of Imperial Japan, and the end of the absolute hegemony of European powers in Asia. The executive producer of Everything Everywhere Daily is Charles Daniel. The associate producers are Benji Long and Cameron Kiever. I want to give a big shout out to everyone who supports the show over on Patreon, including the show's producers. Your support helps me put out a show every single day. And also, Patreon is currently the only place where Everything Everywhere Daily merchandise is available to the top tier of supporters. If you'd like to talk to other listeners of the show and members of the Completionist Club, you can join the Everything Everywhere Daily Facebook group or Discord server. Links to everything are in the show notes.